you for tuning in to Market for Immaterial Value. We're Valentina Carga and Peter Young Grantry, and today we're here with Joe Edelman, who defines himself as a utopian designer, and he has initiated projects varying from couchsurfing to street game festivals. I don't think comments are useful at all. Um, I think that there are things holding together capitalism and holding together the, the, the current kinds of market structures, which are not just public opinion or something. If it was all public opinion, then maybe comments would actually be useful. Mm-hmm. Because <laughs> because like a lot of people would see artwork and they'd have some kind of transformative experience and then they'd be like, oh, I'm going to do something different because I've had this deep experience or something, right? But that's not the case. So comments are totally useless, um, which is a little sad. Um, if you're building something, uh, then if you're building something, I think building something is really worthwhile. Um, there's uh, a few different approaches, broadly. Um, one is to build something that's outside the market, or at least outside current. Um, this doesn't have to be something without money, but it's often easiest to make it something without money. Um, like um, the Austin Foundation would be a good example of a version of this with money. Do you know what the Austin Foundation is? No. no. This is a group, uh, it's a worldwide organization that gives just a thousand dollar grants to artists. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're made of a membership that donates, I think, a hundred dollars a month to, or a hundred euros a month in Europe to the pool and then they give as many thousand dollar grants as they can so it's just grouping people into groups of ten (laughs) who Um, gives the hundred euro every member of the awesome society society. and then they meet and they decide to give a thousand dollar grant to an artist but they are more like wealthier people they're people who can afford yeah a hundred euros a hundred euros per month yeah so it's not a big getting return for this uh, pride it's kind of like a trust yeah, it's like a, it's like a, um, yeah, like a, a trust or a foundation for a broader, more democratic, still wealthy but not as wealthy yeah. base, yeah. right? Yeah. So this is an example of something that exists kind of outside uh, the market, outside. Um, it's it's with money, but it's not really like changing the world exactly. It's yeah. adding something. You know? yeah. It's adding something that works, <laughs> yeah. right? So that's one approach is to design something that can augment the current situation um, mm-hmm. and, and make it better. And usually the, all of those, that, that way of working, and couchsurfing is another example of adding something this time without money, involves designing two different components. One is a pool of resources, and the other is a mechanism for their allocation, a non-capitalist mechanism for their allocation. Right? Mm-hmm. So cash surfing ratings and reviews and the search algorithm is the method for allocation. And um, just the, the platform yeah. is the way. I also like that in cash surfing, I just heard it yesterday from a friend actually. She is in, she is in Berlin for a while and she needed a, a bicycle and she found a company which is called, I think it's like bike surfing or something. And it's mm-hmm. like, uh, it started on couchsurfing, actually. Sure, yeah. yeah. So people that uh, that started like connecting people with bicycles and give them away for a, a donation of, of one euro a day, I think. So you can, for one euro a day, you can get a bike from anybody who's not using this bike. So you, you founded couchsurfing, right? I was part of a team of seven. Yeah. Can, can you talk to us about how did that start? Like yeah, couchsurfing started as a um, bullet board with a pool of resources because people were... So the, the inside of Gatshurfing came from Casey. Uh, he, t- he won tickets to Iceland on a radio show, just like randomly. And he's a programmer and he um, didn't know where he was going to stay because he had free tickets and he didn't have a place to stay. And so at this time, it was like the early internet, it was like 2001, 2002. And... Um, the University of Helsinki had like all of the student emails, like you could search the student right. directory and see every student's email. And so he wrote a little script in PHP that spidered um, that directory, and he emailed all 
of the university students. In <laughs> Austin <laughs> at this university, which is like about 2,000 students. And like something like 70% of them wrote back and said that he could stay. Wow. <laughs> then he told me. And he was like, yeah, yeah. And so he, start, he started out just adding a, a, a PHP bulletin board um, on his personal website, which was already like a PHP website or whatever, just installed PHP PB okay. and made forums that said, hey, if you've got a place to stay, here's uh, uh, different continents and under them different countries and major cities, and you can go into this forum and post a place you have to stay, and that way people uh, you know, can travel. And about 10,000 people did that. And then it started to fail. Um, uh, because new people that showed up wanting a place to stay saw all of these listings and didn't know who would be good to stay with and who wouldn't be good to stay with. Mm -hmm. And, um, and similarly when someone contacted people, people started getting enough inbound surf requests or messages or whatever on this page people on board. That they were like, oh, who? How can I decide? Like, because I want maybe I want like you know just two people to stay with me a year or something, or two people. To, yeah. Like, who should I? You know, they're just all just sort of random people. And at the beginning, this is kind of a cool experiment yeah. with hosting whoever wrote me. But yeah. now there's enough people that I'm kind of like, well, I don't, I don't want to host everybody, and I don't want to just like roll dice. It's a matter. It was a matter of scale. Like yeah. Well, it's a matter of this, you know, when there's a pool of resources, there needs to be a mechanism for their allocation. Mm -hmm. And uh, Austin Foundation is running to the same problem. Mm -hmm. um, now that they have enough people that want grants, their decision-making process, which is like the trustees meet and decide who should get the grant, um, almost everybody inside Austin Foundation, which is now tens of thousands of people around the world. They all decide. No, 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 each city decides, mm -hmm. but they all think that it's a bad process, mm -hmm. like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, to have to discuss every artist and so on, and some of them have, like, committees or whatever, and the committees have all this, like, weird power, even though it's just a thousand dollar grants, like, mm -hmm. they're giving grants to their friends, and like, right, of course. and so, so there's this sort of effort within Austin awesome Foundation to have a better way mm -hmm. to decide who gets these grants. Yeah. And within foundations in general, this is hugely problematic and doesn't work well. And almost Knight, Knight Foundation is my favorite. Do you guys know Knight Foundation? No. This is a one of the biggest foundations in the U.S. So um, Gates is the biggest, and then MacArthur, Ford, and Knight. Are Knight. How do you call it? K N I G H T. Oh, okay. And Knight has a very different grant review process than um, any other foundation I know of which is that they have like tens of thousands of experts kind of like embedded in society in different topic areas. And so when they get a grant, they pick um, who's going to review the grant. Mm -hmm. And they're all people that don't work for the foundation and then only maybe review one or two grants a year mm -hmm. um, and that are very much involved in whatever the field is. So it's a better way to do it. Not Still not maybe a great way, but... Um, Anyway, the way I understand why the bullet board version broke is because it had a pool of resources, but not a good mechanism for their allocation, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so we had to build one, and that was a kind of a social network where people got reviews and um, a kind of reputation, and the, there was a lot to that. It was a really involved design process. Um, our goal was that somebody who was going to travel for the first time was usually pretty skeptical about the whole idea. Like, I'm going to stay with strangers? That's pretty weird, right? Um, but they would look at a few profiles and based on some affinity or some, uh, just the trustworthiness of somebody and how many positive reviews they'd be like, they'd be like, oh, well, I normally wouldn't stay with a stranger, but I'm very happy to stay with this guy. Like, this, that's, that sounds great, right? And so we spent a year uh, rearranging the profiles and changing the text that we had people type in um, so that uh, people would feel really good about it. And this is all voluntary based or you had some grants or some funding for, for uh, We raised uh, money from our users. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. It was like a kind of a crowdfunding. Uh, uh, just donations, like Wikipedia. Yeah. Yeah. And at its peak, uh, four years ago, Couchsurfing was generating $6 million a year. Yeah. From really? users, yeah. From donations? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, a good, that's yeah. very good, no? Yeah, yeah, it was great. Wikipedia, which is huge, right? Um, everybody in the world uses it, generates something like $30 million a year. So the cash that can generate sex is really amazing. It's really good mm -hmm. compared to that. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess people have good experiences and then they didn't value these. That's so right. And we ask for donations right after you have your first stay. Yeah. And that, that works very well. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, so actually the donations do work. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if you give people a really positive experience, then donations definitely work. Because they don't, of course, they don't pay for their stay, so they somehow might feel also a little bit sure. Like I, I want to, you know, it was so nice, and I like stayed a week in uh, or I don't know a weekend totally. in. Uh, Especially as they discover nice the kind of value that Couchsurfing delivers, which is really different than Airbnb, for instance. Like if, if they or hotels, like because they usually have this like personal connection or whatever. So then they're kind of like, like, not only did they not play for their place to stay, but they got this like other bonus thing yeah. that's worth much more, you know? <laughs> and how, it, how is this money, uh, or is, is money, is the donation money spent transparently? Or okay, it is, yeah. so you can actually look up the budget of okay. yeah. Yeah. Um, for the last, yeah, eight years or whatever. Yeah, that's, that's so the, the people who work for the platform they actually get paid. Mm -hmm. you know, like, how do you manage it? Because I th I, it, you're like kind of a cooperative or like collective. It was a nonprofit. It's not exactly a nonprofit oh. anymore. Um, not a collective. Um, normal board structure, CEO, mm -hmm. okay. nonprofit. Um, but um, but so it's a company. Yeah, it's. Yeah, now it's a company. Before it was a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. um, under me, it was a nonprofit. I, 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 Casey and I ran it together for only three years, and during those three years, we were trying to maximize something, n not money at all, um, uh, something we called net orchestrated conviviality, which is the amount of like positive togetherness, especially across different cultures. Mm -hmm. that um, we created. So we were very growth-oriented um, because every time we got new users signing up and staying with each other, we had more of this conviviality, like more yeah. of these hours together that we wanted to maximize. So it was organized in a kind of a um, traditional leadership model, but all geared towards something besides profit. Exactly, yeah. But uh, in, in the meantime... I mean, because it, it looks as, as if something that makes absolutely no money at all, because mm -hmm. it's that's not the, the medium that you use. Mm -hmm. But actually, you do make money for, for your work, and it's not that you uh, ask everybody to work for, voluntarily to organize and maintain such a huge thing. You know? right. So that's actually very interesting, like how it, when you take the focus away from the money, in the end you get also... Uh, Remunerated back for, mm -hmm. for it works. I mean, it works best with things that are at pretty large scale, right? Yeah. So we had 22 users. We had 22 employees or 26 employees in that kind of range, mm -hmm. and like 10 million users. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they also have other started other or in, or are involved in other uh, similar projects. Do they also think about the economy of it, or it's always kind of like a side thing like it's, it's a you mean the money flow of it? Yeah. yeah do you do you incorporate the, as part of the core of the project or it's really a second any project? organization needs cash flow mm. I mean even Occupy Wall Street needs cash flow yeah. right there needs to be some story about how yeah. if you're I mean the thing that I'm doing right now I have meetups in many cities and you know, most of it's volunteers, but I have like professional video production for some of it, and I have, um, uh, you know, we want to buy food for people at these meetups, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so any organization needs some story about cash flow. I don't usually find it very difficult. Like I think that people, um, 
squash their dreams because they think the money is going to be the hard part. Yeah. And so they, they're like, oh, I'm not going to do that at all because that's not going to make any money and I'll do this other thing. Um, I think that's terrible. In my experience, the money is not ever the hard part. Like, um, the, there's lots of sources of money if you manage to design something that's really good for people because then everybody notices. Right. <laughs> it means a little bit that to incorporate, like now we're, we're thinking kind of ways on, on specifically or more uh, towards art, how art can sustain a, a self-sufficient monetary status with this outside the art market, outside the funding system that can be in itself of... of user, yeah. On user-based and yeah. user-based value, right? Not, not only user-based, like that, that's a little bit the problem because I, I feel very bad with stuff like Kickstarter or, or crowdfunding because there is so much money in the world and it is in the hands of this very, very few and I feel very bad to ask all these poor people for a euro right, to right, do right. again a project while, while there is... There I is think there is something there. there. I think yeah. that... Um, uh, my experience... I don't know if you have... Um, I think it's a little different in Europe. Like, the wealthy people are different in Europe. But in... My experience with wealthy people in the US is that they've been really generous. Mm. But they're sometimes hard to reach for mm. people. Um, and they're often giving, if you look at their giving, they often do give a lot, but they give to stupid things. Like they give to like universities. And uh, instead of giving to uh, individual directors, they give to like some theater house that does like some conservative whatever, mm -hmm. right? And then they yeah. give to this traditional older stuff. And it's really just because they don't know what they're doing. Like they don't have a good understanding of different yeah. things that they can Yeah, I think this is the hard part that comes with money. Like, imagine you have a lot of money and, and or you reach, you, you do a project that's going to better the world and you reach a phase where you really generate a lot of money. Who are you going to give it to? Like, right. where are you going to start helping? Like, or where are you going to start giving back? I think that's also not uh, easy. Yeah, do you know donors choose? No. Donors choose is a, has an interesting, so it's a, it looks like a crowdfunding platform. <laughs> How do you write this? Donors, yeah, D O N R R S C H O O S E. So, donors? Donors? Choose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. It's, uh, it looks like Kickstarter for classrooms. Like, um, public school is really broken in the US. And the way Donors Choose works is that teachers, public school teachers, post projects that they'd like to do with their class that would require some money. It might be a field trip, might be building a rocket, building a robot, I don't know, whatever, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. And they post the exact budget they need, and then in a sort of Kickstarter-y way, um, uh, the, the people fund it. So it's, it's really kind of gross in a way, because it's like public education, yeah. and it's like the state is just like given up <laughs> like actually paying for public yeah. education, right? Mm -hmm. it, and it looks like it's got this Kickstarter problem that you're talking about, like as if like the poor neighborhood people are, are paying. But it's not actually true. If you look at who funds these projects sure. and how it works, what you see is that a small number of very rich people are actually paying for public education in the U.S. And they're giving, they're, they're, they have, Donors Choose has like this kind of sales team where they talk to very rich people about funding not one classroom project, but tens of thousands. Um, and they do it in the form of like either matching grants or these sort of like sweeping, like a whole state at a time, like all of the projects in California or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so it ends up being uh, wealthy people that are paying for public school in the US now. Uh, even though the platform itself looks very democratic, um, like if you go on, it's a little hard to tell yeah. that all of these funded projects are actually funded by wealthy people. It looks like you could fund them yourself, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's kind of cool. It makes the wealthy people feel like they're, you know, I don't know, they're on the same platform as the normal people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Back in a good way. Yeah. But anyway, I don't think um, that's that's our problem at the moment. Like what. Peter, uh, oh, actually, I was just so. Yeah. 
I brought up capture ring and awesome foundation as an example of just one of three approaches. Exactly. Let's so, go back yeah. to the approach. So these are all approaches for building something. I'm not really going to talk to you about comments because I think they're dumb. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, let's... let's yeah, so three do. approaches to building something. One is to build something outside of the market um, that adds to the situation. Um, another is... Um, to build something that interferes with the market. Uh, and a third would be to build something that replaces the market. Um, Do you have examples? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These other two are much harder. Yeah. Um, and you really do need to do much more. So there's a you have to do a lot of engineering to do the first approach, the awesome foundation capturing approach. Mm -hmm. It's really a lot of it's an iterative design problem, both for the resource pool part and for the allocation part, mm -hmm. right? And like obviously the awesome foundation didn't finish their design. Like they designed a really nice scalable kind of club model, yeah. but they didn't design how to choose the artists, yeah. and they yeah. need to keep looping on that. And so, just in couchsurfing, we needed to keep looping on that for you know more than a couple of but years. But it's right? a process. I mean, perhaps it's not finished. I mean, yeah, yeah, no, it's totally cool. Yeah. I'm just trying to say where the work is because the work is in different places. I think for these different approaches. Mm -hmm. So the work for building something outside the market um, is design of these mechanisms, and it's iterative. And you know, you, you can launch something early, but you will expect to keep changing how it gathers assets, how people sign up, yeah. that kind of stuff, and yeah. how it allocates them. Yeah. Um, the work, if you're building something that interferes with or replaces the market, is much more analysis of capitalism and the current capital markets. Mm -hmm. um, Bitcoin would be kind of a good example. Um, so. Bitcoin was incredibly well designed, but designed kind of like a weapon, more than like an alternative <laughs> or a community mm -hmm. or something. If you look at the launch of Bitcoin, Bitcoin is now branched into a thousand things, and one of them, Stellar, is replacing international payments. So it's like um, Bitcoin is, although the Bitcoin currency itself is kind of like we're not clear what's happening with it. Uh, in general, the innovations behind Bitcoin are actually fucking with global monetary structures. Mm -hmm. Like, um, like it, it's very clear to all the banks, for instance, that they're no longer going to be able to move money around from country to country and currency to currency privately. They're going to use an internet-like global public system to do that mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of Bitcoin. So... The, the guy who designed Bitcoin, who's this anonymous, shady character, <laughs> Satoshi, um, studied uh, the dynamics of cash and trading and hoarding and all this kind of stuff for a long time and figured out what features a cryptocurrency would need to have. Like it needs to um, double the amount that you have. It seemed like a really good investment at first. Mm -hmm. um, right? Like all this kind of stuff is designed to like directly interfere and potentially replace uh, with the transactions that are already occurring. And I think to do that, I mean, the way I'm sort of doing something similar right now, the way you go about it is you have to really look at the motivations of the people that are using the current system and the practices of the people that are current using the current system mm -hmm. and being like, what would interrupt this, you know, like, what, like, like, if you understand that people who are currently, you know, holding some gold and some money, like, why do they do that, and what's the ratio about, then you can start to be like, oh, they would hold Bitcoin instead, if, it, if there's something like, you know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are, there are countries where Bitcoin is used as a main thing, because the uh, local currency is much more unstable than Bitcoin, so they, like, I think in, in, even Argentina. Yeah, which is really large, but the peso is so 
Uh, and Bitcoin is so expensive, right? Like, I don't know, 500 dollars or something. One. Yeah, you can buy like a thousand or so of one or something. Um, uh, yeah, so this guy actually like knew that, like going in. And he designed the currency so that like he had ideas about where it would take hold and mm-hmm. who would be the you know the, the people that latched onto it first and who would be the miners and how this yeah. whole thing would work. Um, and, uh, and he was thinking about the profit, you know, like that this thing would could make for him. No, or no, no. Yeah. He's a libertarian, I think, and he wants to divorce currency from state control. Yeah. Um, and I think he actually, in the long run, he, 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 yeah, I think it might work. Like, <laughs> which is a little scary because I'm not a libertarian. Well, I, mean, <laughs> I think currency is divorced from state control in a way. Mm-hmm. No, like the problem is that it's controlled yeah. too much by the banks. It's not the state mm-hmm. anymore. Our enemy, let's yes. say. Well, I mean, that's a good thing about Bitcoin. It also kind of divorces itself from bank control. It becomes this kind of neutral thing, which is um, less subject to status and power hierarchies, but more subject to all the other problems of capitalism, um, like um, uh, uh, arbitrage, the uh, distance between uh, the people who actually produce things and the people who consume them. Like, Bitcoin makes money even more liquid. Yeah. Um, it will lower transaction fees a lot so that um, things like loans are much cheaper for people um, and things like... So that does wonderful things to power hierarchies, right? Like, poor people can get loans cheaper, and that's great. Mm-hmm. Except <laughs> that when all of this is much cheaper... And like intermediaries are cheaper, it's easier, it's cheaper to set because there's no credit card fees, it's cheaper to like buy a bunch of things, resell a bunch of things. The distance and intermediation of capitalism just gets even much more greater and people start taking out way more loans because they're you know, all this kind of stuff, right? So yeah. it's, it's a really mixed bag. Yeah. Um, but that's why there is a lot of critique about Bitcoins at the moment, right? And I, I've seen this new project, relatively newer project called the, the Fair Co- Coop, Fair Cooperative, and it's about making Bitcoins more fair. Hmm. So uh, yeah, yeah. Let me look it up. We can look it up here. Um, and also. Um, the Robin Hood Coop. Yeah, the Robin Hood is something else. What was it? The other thing that they found in Crypto? Oh, I should say something about all these platforms because you guys are kind of concerned with platforms. You see what? this one? Mm-hmm. And I mean, we could watch their um, animation to, yeah. to understand what it is. But um, to me, it, it also seems a little bit. Uh, like a, a theoretical model. Yeah. Right? It's not yet working. So, um, oh, this is, so, okay, I, here's a, a random other thing that I thought to say based on mostly on what Peter told me mm-hmm. um, a few days ago. Uh, almost all of these innovations and platforms fail. Um, like you know, ninety nine percent of them, and some of the ones that even seem like sort of like they could be successes are secretly failures. Um, you guys know um, time banks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So time banks. Yeah, I would know that they, yeah. they fail. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody uses these platforms. Yeah, so there's a lot of that too. Like yeah. a lot of the like alternative scene is sort of pretending. This or that works when it doesn't. Yeah. yeah. But they're all in the end experiments. No, they they also they they just like let's try. And this I, I I can appreciate. And of course, if it feels like well, I think there's a really common reason they fail, which I will name, <laughs> 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 which is um, 
people who make these platforms often, often presume that the problem is one of coordination. Like, they assume that what's missing is a web platform, um, and that people would do whatever behavior they think is ideal if there was only an easier way to coordinate it, right? Mm -hmm. So if there's only a, um, uh, yeah, a way for people to trade hours, of course they would trade hours, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and you can even sort of say that about, like you can imagine that what couchsurfing does, but I think this is a wrong story, you can imagine what couchsurfing does is coordinate people who want to share their homes and people want to, um, you know, use those shared homes, right? Which is how most of these people who make these platforms like frame when they say that a mission is. They, they make a mission statement that's kind of about coordination. As if the people already exist and we just need to connect them. Yeah. That's a lie. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. um, what capturing does is mostly create people who didn't earlier want to stay with strangers and now they do. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> Yeah. Um, and so that's in the, mi the mindset. That's right, yeah. yeah well, giving them, it's a whole bunch of things. Giving them incentives, right? Because they get reviewed. Yeah. And they become popular in this kind of like new way, right? Um, showing them that it's safe. Um, showing them the advantages of it, of course, you know, like that. It's all these different things, right? Um, and finally, making it easy and coordinating. Is that kind of like the last thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's a really small part of the problem. And usually, if some kind of trade or some kind of thing isn't happening out there in the world already, it's not because of a missing web platform, right? Yeah. It's because the populations that want to do this don't actually exist yet. It's not because it hasn't occurred to them, because it's very easy to share an idea like staying with a stranger. Like, you can just post to Facebook and you'd be like, I stay with a stranger. And then, you know, if it was really popular, then everybody would just, like, stay with strangers, like, as soon as they heard about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> right? But that doesn't happen at all. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, I think that's actually, like, whenever I see one of things fail, it almost always has this misunderstanding, and yet people keep having this misunderstanding. So you mean that there is no actually uh, need for it to happen? It's not that the platform is missing, it's actually the need is missing. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I want to ask you... The like, transaction, like yeah. the whole way that it could be a good thing. It's like no one would... Yeah, go, sorry, go ahead. So, do you mean, uh, do you mean that these time banks is the, this alternative model that fits the third category to build something that replaces the market? No, that was my negative example of a coordination platform. Okay. So, so, the designers of time banks imagined that people just like wanted to use them, mm -hmm. and that what was missing was like a central time bank yeah. coordination platform. And, and they're wrong. And it would actually be quite difficult to design why. Someone would like. Why would a surgeon want to, or why would a a lawyer even want to open up his home for a stranger? Yeah, like that's that's like a that's that's like, that's some work, right? And similarly with time, like why would a lawyer want to, um, uh, you know, like trade his hours of legal service for something else, right? The, the answer to both of those, honestly, is like. Well, we don't know yet, but we could try to make something up. We could make up a story, we could tell a lawyer, we could make up some incentives, we could make up some rewards or whatever, and you know, and then maybe they would want to. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what, the, what would be in the third category? A replacing. I think to replace... B Bitcoin was there. No, well, no, no. Bitcoin no. was in the second yeah, Bitcoin, I think, is but interfering. Yeah. And maybe replacing bits of it or something. So I think to really replace the market, you have to like, um, you have to understand something about human psychology that money doesn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's the work, of, you know, because we said the first yeah, is yeah, engineering. Yeah. <laughs> I do. So this is what I'm working on now. Uh, I'm working on like, yeah, totally replacing the economy. 
So you were reading Marx. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, I actually think that Marx was like not very helpful. Um, okay. It's too bad. He's still so popular in Europe. It's like no one has any imagination. <laughs> but he really said everything, you know. Like he was also really a, a great uh, psychologist in a way. And yeah, because he was really understanding the, the human needs and the why, why is it, you know, that commodities are so special to people and things like that. I think actually, so I think that all that stuff was like, and he's clearly a very smart guy, definitely smart, <laughs> but. I think that there's other stories to be told, like, instead of commodity fetishism, this guy, um, uh, Manfred Max Neef, uh, Chilean alternative economist, has this theory of human needs, um, and, uh, how, and he, he splits the market up into, uh, uh, goods, services, and, um, or, he differentiates between goods and what he calls satisfiers, which is like a complex constellation of things, like a marriage or a, um, uh, like a, a way that you get one of your needs met. So let's say one of your needs is to like um, uh, feel really connected to your relatives, then, and your grandma lives like an hour away, then like the public boss that gets you to visit your grandma is part of that satisfier and like the um, fact that you have time to visit your grandma like once a week or something whatever like all these things mm. and your grandma like all these things together form what he calls a satisfier and he goes into like you know are satisfiers made entirely of goods that are on the market or are they not made of goods and like how much of our purchases can be explained in terms of us trying to satisfy these needs. And um, I think that's a much more helpful analysis than Marx. But no one, no one anywhere, not in America, not in Europe or whatever, knows about Max Neef. They all know about Marx. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so what's his name, Manfred? Max Neef, M A X dash N E E F. There's a lot of people like that. I mean, mm. economists kept writing after Marx, and people yes, just stopped course. reading I think I think it's uh, also a problem of saturation, you know, like, there's so many people nowadays that are super smart, and they're writing amazing books, but there's so many of it out there, yeah. you know, and Marx is kind of the basis for all of that. So people just sort of, like, start with Marx, yeah. and then stop? <laughs> yeah, so I, I think that I guess maybe I don't think even Marx actually wrote enough to like like um, communism or Marxism or whatever doesn't really have a plan um, for replacing capitalism, right? It's like very it's nonsense. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's more like a, an analysis. It's not. It doesn't yeah. offer. It's again critique. It does not offer yeah. the alternative. Yeah. Well, it's sort of like he sort of like names like he he makes like a box for the alternative and says things that are like some some qualities it might have, but never actually says what it might be. Yeah. Um, so okay, uh, but do you have any specific example of the third category? Well, it hasn't been done yet. <laughs> um, but I'm I working on it. Yeah. No. <laughs> but let's uh, you know if we all start working on that, then maybe we will be able to do it. You know, like my feeling is that that change will come from many sides simultaneously. And you know, we do this thing that addresses the art market. You do that other thing that I disagree actually. Something else, and it's worth you know? saying this, even though. It's not going to help you with your project. <laughs> um, I think that I've come to think that what capitalism is is a whole bunch of consequences of some very simple, very local actions, which we could describe as a transaction, or we could even more simply describe as a choice. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
Um, when you choose something from a menu, uh, like a restaurant, <laughs> <laughs> or um, when you uh, decide to make a trade, right, which is, which is sort of what you're doing when you choose something from a menu, right, you're like saying, oh, I'll give two euros, I'll give a sandwich, right? Like, that just about everything else, corporations, investment, um, the art market, etc., kind of emerge from the nature of those kinds of choices. And there's a reason that we make those kinds of choices historically. Like, they're, it's a very simple, the idea of doing this trade, like, a oh, trade some money or even a tra- barter, like a trade thing for another thing or something, is really cool. It's, it's, it's very different than democracy, for instance, like, because when you make a trade, only those two people have to talk about what the terms are or whatever, right? It's, like, super efficient. Like, you can just, like, if you have this kind of, like, private property-ish thing, you have these, like, trade choices, each person can kind of weigh, and they do their own accounting, and then they make the trade, and they both feel better off, and um, uh, no one else needs to be consulted. You compare that to, like, how we decide what to do with, like, Tempelhofer or something, mm-hmm. where, like, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people have to be consulted, or a million people have to be consulted, mm-hmm. right? And that's, like, a lot less efficient, and obviously wouldn't have worked at all before we had, like, all the good communication networks we have, uh, in, you know, since the 18th century or whatever. And, um, even something like Bitcoin is really different than the cash model because there's this like universal record and like sort of everybody's informed those two people are the only people that assign with Bitcoin but it all goes out to the blockchain chain and there's like that much more communication going on around these trades mm-hmm. anyway I think that capitalism comes from these trades and that if you're replacing capitalism you're not like like the only w- way to really do it is to change the nature of like choosing from a menu or making a choice like change how that like two people decide whether to give each other a sandwich like right yeah. and then that's actually a simple and universal aspect of human life um, and it's not and the people are only going to do like even democracy democracy doesn't really work because it's so rare, like, it's not really part, like, voting is not, like, something we constantly do every day, right? But, like, these trades are something we constantly do every day, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So, I don't know, I, my, my feeling is that there's only really room for, like, one way of, like, deciding, like, moment to moment how we're going to... But there is, like, also back in time, the... the Debt is, is equally as big. It is not always barter that you say, I, I want uh, an apple, you want this, we share. It is like uh, a good friend of mine, he's a Tuareg from, from Mali, and they work there the same as they ever did, or even in the village in Valentina's uh, parents, how they work. It's kind of like, I, I like your hat, and you give the hat. It's free. Right, yeah, no, that's different. That's then, really different. Yeah, yeah. And, at any, at any given point, when, somebody, when he has something back, you know, every, it's, it's given. Or when Valentina's father fixes a car or somebody, he doesn't pay, but then he can go and get some fish or some bread the next day or the next week or the week after. Well, it's, it's not exactly <laughs> like that. That's a romantic idea. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, it is very common for, for people not to use what, money. Yeah, what it's Peter true. says is that we, we shouldn't mix economy with capitalism, because economy is something that always exists. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree, yeah, and so... Economic bonds are also the social bonds that bind society together. So yeah, all I'm saying is that the war for our, like, future way of deciding allocations of resources happens on this level that we're talking about, on the level of, like, mm-hmm. oh, do we make this daily choice by with the hats? Exactly. Not on the level of, like, platforms like couchsurfing or... Um, yeah. Or Austin Foundation, or any, or Bitcoin, even like, like those things don't really make a difference. At the end of the day, you either make every choice or almost every choice using kind of like one paradigm, or almost every choice using another paradigm. 
And I do think technology can make a difference in terms of... But if a platform changes the paradigm, you know, a platform like this changes the paradigm of how do you make the choice. It, it, can cha it could change public imagination and could inspire for other things. I don't, yeah, I don't think that platforms do. I think that, um, uh, I think that, um, uh, like, choice making procedures do. Like, like, um, so, uh, you named one, which would, would a choice making procedure would be like, oh, uh, I like you, you're part of my network, I'll give you the hat, or whatever, right? So that's like really different than like how much the hat worth to me, or whatever, right? Um, and it doesn't work outside of your community, because if you don't know right. the person, you like your hat, but will you ever see him again? Will you ever return a favor? Right, yeah, exactly. You know, so then we need money. Or we need yeah, actually, that that's how money got invented, you know, when the, trans when, yeah. when wa the wars started, so we had to suddenly deal with transactions with people from far away lands, like right. the soldiers, or the troops that were passing. So you, you would know that you could not trust these people because right. they don't belong to your community, they don't live nearby, so they could not get a chance to return your favor. So then you hear when people had to invent this kind of universal medium of exchange. Yeah, so let's call that, instead of money, let's call that like accounting. Yeah, but the danger is the stackability of it. You can, you can, you can collect it. Yeah. But if it's a hat, it's a, you it's can't collect you it. Can, you, you consume right away. Sure. So You can accumulate it. Like, we'll, we'll say that we went, at that point in history, from uh, choices about um, uh, reputation and gifts, or social connection and gifts, mm -hmm. uh, to choices about uh, accounting around trades, mm -hmm. um, and whether it was barter or money, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think that we'll yeah. hopefully take another step to a different way of accounting for uh, our, our choices, um, based on, I think, fulfillment. Um, this is what I'm working on, but you can imagine it going in different direct directions. So, so what I'm working on is um, I have software that asks people when they bought something or they want to buy something or when they want to download an app or use a website or whatever, why? <laughs> um, like what they really want. Um, so if they're using Tinder, like do you want to get laid, do you want a relationship, like what do you want, right? Um, if you're, um, come again, come again. I didn't, I didn't. If you're using Tinder, you know Tinder. It's like yeah. A, the, like why? Why are you using it? Do you want to get like? Do you want to have sex? Mm -hmm. Do you want a relationship? Do you want a husband? Right. But that's what the application. Or, or I have a survey you. kind of that asks people uh -huh. why they're doing what they do. If you're using Facebook, do you want to connect with your friends? Um, do you want to get people to come to your event? Right. There's always reasons. That so you're researching the motives of people. Uh, That's right. Yeah. And there's a different way of accounting for whether a choice is a good choice about whether it advances each of the people in the direction of like what they really want. Right. So if uh, so, exercise bicycles, for instance, don't work. Like. Um, uh, people buy them and then they never use them and they don't get fit. Um, so if Peter makes an exercise bicycle and I buy it, and he didn't really like making it, and I'm not going to use it, that's bad. Like, yeah, right? That's useless. Yeah, yeah. but it, it makes money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Exactly. It only makes, I mean, the reason that it works right now is because we don't have any visibility yeah. into his reasons and my reasons. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you had visibility, then maybe even as we were about to make a trade, we'd be like, oh, this isn't a good trade at all. You're not going to do it. <laughs> yeah, we don't even like building them, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, that's my idea for another choice-making procedure. And there's, of course, technology that can support that and that can like push it, but it's not a platform at the end of it, right? 
It's just a way of Peter but, and I. But how do you imagine uh, sharing your findings or communicating? The, I mean, okay, that's the research is one part, and I understand sure. this. But then, how do you imagine to intervene to create a structure? I have a wonderful document about this strategy document. It's a um, I'm I yeah I'm good on that point. Um, <laughs> if you want to share it, because. Maybe this will be public. Maybe we can um, cut this part. It's fine, although I will give a talk on it in about like eight okay. months or something. It won't be the big reveal. But <laughs> I don't think very many people will listen to this point. <laughs> <laughs> I guess nobody will it's listen really to this It's not really a secret. It's podcast. just like pre-launch. Um, um, Uh, several ways. Uh, so the first way is that I gather all these reasons and I get people to say whether things worked out for them. So the exercise bike doesn't work out or whatever. And then I label in the same way that organic and bio are like labels on produce or whatever, the, the purchases that tend to work out for the people that make them. So uh, uh, I in the app stores at first and on listings at websites and later in online stores like Amazon we start seeing this label that's like, let's call it time well spent, right? So um, Tinder is time well spent for um, having sex, but maybe not time well spent for... On your partner. Or whatever, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we start by just communicating to people as they're purchasing, like this information about their reasons, what their reasons might be, and how they work out. A next step is that a major release of an, a phone operating system um, has like this review thing in it, this new thing in it, where it asks you, and I already have a Chrome extension that does this just for Chrome. So, so my Chrome extension asks you, for last week, if you spent an hour on Facebook, what were you hoping for, and how did it work out? And when you answer that question, it gives you a bunch of community information about, like, Oh, if you're hoping to connect with friends, these are some of the best ways that people are connecting with friends. Yeah. <laughs> right? And Facebook turns out not to be one of them, or whatever, right? <laughs> um, and um, through these mechanisms, the label and the review and the social information coming out of the review, we get a lot of market power. Like, we start... Because... Because no one really wants to be wasting their life. Like, Peter doesn't want to be building exercise bikes in particular. And I don't really want, right? <laughs> like, so as this information becomes available, it starts changing what people do, right? And that makes for a lot of power over the economy. Um, yeah, and then there's stages after that, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of ways to roll it out. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, but the end result has to be this, you know, at the level of the difference between giving a hat and, right? It's not some internet thing, <laughs> you know? No, it's, no, the internet is just the medium. We should not get confused about this. I right. think we're saying the same no, thing. Yeah, well, well, I guess it's not, and it's also not topical. Like, it's not in the art market, or it's not, in the, right? It's, yeah. it's about how do we make choices in the future, in my future, we make choices based yeah. on what's going to be fulfilling for both of us. Well, um, we, didn't want, we don't want it to be topical either, you right. know, what we're doing. Maybe it's something, but we start from, from the art because this is at the moment our resource, you know, is what we have to give and to share. Sure. And maybe it can expand to other things as well, but uh, I think it's also very dangerous at this stage to to make it about everything because then it's, you know, not, not we cannot handle that. Sure. So we have to make a very small intervention about a very small part of, of, of our lives and of the economy or of, or of society and is it the part that we semi belong to and sure and semi I guess what, the reason I'm saying platform is like uh, whether it's a found grant giving foundation or couch surfing it's really clear that the new way of making choices is very localized in this, like in the foundation, it's really just the member of the boards of foundation or whatever, the people that decide in the arts grant. Mm -hmm. Those are the only people that have their own choice making system, mm -hmm. right? Um, and platforms in general are like that. Like, 
that um, there's some group that does this other kind of choice making, but it's only on the site and it's only, right? And so maybe that's the difference that when I'm talking about replacing the economy mm -hmm. is, is everyone making a new choice kind of way of cho choosing or is it, is it just, you know, the, the people once a month when they're deciding on a grant, just the 20 people that, you know, yeah. right? yeah. So, um, I think actually Couchsurfing is, is a very good example of how it manages to, um, to, to take, uh, what I was saying a little bit before, to take the focus away from the money without excluding that we are, we are a part of a system that where we use money and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and that it, it creates a way to envision life that is outside of you know money transactions is about mm -hmm. staying together and sharing an experience mm -hmm. but at the same time it does generate an income for all the people who are working to, to sustain this platform and keep it going and so on to offer these its services to the people and so on yeah for 22 people mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> it makes a living for yeah 22 people. Yeah, so <laughs> and I think this is great because we are used to, to, to do things that give back to a, a community or, you know, under this idea of sharing or, and we're doing it for free all the time. We keep working for free and this is just a, a commanding precarity and we don't want to do that anymore. Sure. So my, my question is like, how can we do more projects like this? that do generate an income for us to live and at the same time create a way to imagine the world away from only money, you know, because the focus is not there. Yeah. And, and I think that's the biggest danger at the moment regarding uh, capitalism or, or um, it's, it's not just economic transaction, transactions, it's, where the, it's the point where money tends to become the end Sure. instead of the means, right? And, and that's what financialization does, you know? Right. Financialization is not something from the top imposed to all of us, it's something that we generate with our everyday uh, choices, yeah, like for instance, in a way. Blah, blah, car that you, you just uh, have people that are driving from here to there, they have a free space, they put it on there. People that need to ride from here to there, they can email them and they, they pay them. But there is this company that takes this transaction and there is like no reason why why this should happen, why this company should take this money. Because yeah, they have nothing talking to do about with this. This, what is called platform co cooperativism. So yeah. that the money, the income that, that right. is generated goes back yeah. to the users and it's distributed yeah. instead of centralized. But so what that, I'm saying is that when this focus would be off the money, when there would be no, uh, it, it could be the same as, as a couch surfing, it could be the same as yeah. sure. sharing a car. As just sharing a car, because they yeah. even check the messages you write. Like a friend of mine, she wrote to a guy who had an empty car because she wants to move, he wants to bring all the stuff. She, she wrote in a message, uh, could we discuss this outside of the website? because she wanted to pay a bit more for, for her stuff to move. Mm. And the website, they replied back to her, we deleted your message, it didn't go delivered because it's violating blah, blah, blah. So you're, mm. it, it's even not, not a, yeah, not a, you, you can't do the transactions you, you, ex you need from, from a platform like that. So actually it's a pretty useless platform, but still it generates a point. So we should make an, an open up <laughs> Yeah, so that's exactly what I mean, like how can we think of economy not like against everything that we know, but to make these smaller interventions that just take the focus away from the money. Mm -hmm. Because we still need money, it's not that we are going to... But we don't need so much. We don't need so much as well. Yeah, well, if you, if you don't have to pay the artists, but just the people that are running the show, <laughs> <laughs> and then it becomes I think it actually becomes it's a much easier problem um, what do you mean by that? well couchsurfing pays the people that are running the show pay the people that are running the show but not the hosts yeah. mm -hmm. right 
we try to make other benefits for the hosts. Yeah. Right. So if you you can do the same thing for art, right? You give up on paying your artists. No, but then it's, it's you pay yourselves. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, <that was> a, <laughs> I like it. I like it. Then you only you know, probably you guys could split one million dollars a year and you feel great about it, right? They will, very little. They will kill us, you know. <laughs> really well, I thought that was your idea. You were no. saying you liked couch surfing because it. Uh, it no. makes money for the 22 people that run it. Really? That's, that's, what, that's what's happening when we do that transfer to the arts? Because I think <laughs> our idea was really to make money to pay the artists. Because not, not the artists that does not need the money, you know, but the right. precarious artists like us or like... Okay, well, it's harder to pay. I mean... But we will not pay, pay the people... Who are running the show because the people who are running the show are not the artists, are, are the users that will somehow well, we, we, us. invest. No, I mean, you guys, the host of the uh, uh, or the yeah. host of the structure, yeah. But us together with the artists because we will be running the show. Okay, I mean, it depends on how many artists there are, right? Like if, there's, if there's 10 artists and like a no. million users, they're supporting them, that's not gonna happen, but. <laughs> no, I think then, it, then it's pretty cheap, right? Yeah, we will see how how it goes. But at the moment, this the idea is that to 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 do a project like this every I don't know three or six months, not very often because we don't have the capacity yet to you know to make something so big. So, our, you know, like we we will choose every three months an artist or a curator that also works. With, that oh, like one person artists. every three months. Just for the moment, you know, yeah. if it has the capacity to grow in scale. I think that's the wrong approach. Um, really? Yeah. So you would go with like a big boom? No. Uh, from the um, beginning? So I advocate for this like, it's just like, I give this advice to every single, like whenever anybody has any kind of internet thing, like <laughs> social network thing, I always give them the same advice. Yeah. Which goes by the name in the industry of cross ten. So this is the idea that before you build anything or do anything hard, you should make sure that ten of your trans the transactions that you want to have happen can can happen just with very low investment and low technology. So um, if, for instance, you had the idea that um, it's called the cross ten. Cross ten, yeah, cross ten transactions. So, for instance, if you have the idea that there were people that might want to buy shares in, in performance, mm -hmm. um, you wouldn't do anything. You would try to find 10 artists and 10 people maybe for each of them that would buy shares. And you would do it by posting on Facebook, maybe by calling friends, sending out a group email, maybe with a Google spreadsheet, uh, you know, whatever the least amount of time and investment and effort you can possibly do to make 10 of these things happen. And then after that, you think about building something. But that's actually very easy right. because with with everybody, we have this example that we made this golden coin mm -hmm. for a presentation with the Athens Biennial. And every time we talk about this project and we say, uh, we this this coin, we will share it in one thousand uh, shares of one euro each, and we will be happy with the one thousand euros. Everybody so far said I would buy one. Mm -hmm. Well, I would is a little different than like because but it's one year. But then, yeah, that's too, yeah. I would is a little different than actually making it happen ten yeah. times. Yeah. Right, it's a good signal. Mm -hmm. But um, whereas you're imagining it as like taking this one artist and pushing really hard to make it happen, that's like that's like a way of cheating. Like you actually have no idea why you succeeded if you do that. Like you, there's no information. <laughs> Mm -hmm. about whether you succeeded because you had an amazing video that like made people cry or whatever mm -hmm. or people just like really want to do it or what right <laughs> but if you do it in the cheapest several times in the cheapest way possible then you can be pretty clear that whatever kind of that, that it is because people yeah. actually just want to do this yeah. right and then you know that if you build something it will um, you, you don't have to make some amazing video every time you don't have to right and usually it doesn't happen, like when you try to do it in a low budget way, ten times, like it doesn't work so well, and you change it a little bit, and you come up with something that, uh, that does work, and that um, you don't need to make a big investment in. Yeah. Right? But, uh, you know, like, okay, that's a good advice, but 
still the problem is that we are asking people for money, whereas in Couchsurfing people don't have to pay anything, they just have to, to they give the donations if they want to. But What's the difference? That in the core there is no monetary transactions. There is, I mean, if you sure, know, yeah, no, but I, I it's mean, not like, like do your booking and you pay no, me the why we want to uh, sell shares. You know, like we, we can sell them. Everybody who yeah, knows, understand. but what, why is that? Why are you bringing that up right now? For instance, if you would make a website which has an artwork on the main page, and you oh. said you can get the artwork, just sign up here. So we have a million people signing up, mm -hmm. and we choose one, and he gets the artwork. Mm -hmm. So there is no monetary transaction; it's just free art. Mm -hmm. But you can donate on the website because we, mm -hmm. if, because you could have a that page. would be an equivalent. And then we have you know, and the artist can get. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm just wondering why you're bringing it up right now. Oh, uh, because it's a decision we have to <coughs> we have to do whether we. Oh, uh, you just ask me what I think. Like, yeah. Do, uh, you know, like whether we do we sell a share for a euro, or do we give shares for free? And then we ask people to do I mean, if I were you, I would make this decision based on what you want, what 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 kind of work you want to do. Like that's why I brought up these different approaches, right? Like um, if you just want to do like a quick experiment and like put something on your art resume or something, you did this cool alternate economy experiment, like that requires a bit, that's like a very different then you'd probably pick something different than if you wanted to, like, over time refine the amount of trading it's doing and figure out exactly what, how people can select their artwork or whatever, right? Like, like you're going to come up with different questions based on your goal, and, right? Yeah, yeah, like, a question is also how do we curate, you know, the artist every time? How do we do It's like the same at the, the also Foundation. Right. Has yeah, that. I mean, that, that, that I think that's actually... The artist. If I think about your area a little bit, if I think about the art market, I think it's going to be really difficult to sell art that's going to be made anyway, but pretty, uh, very difficult to uh, like, yeah, collect that in any kind of meaningful sense, but you, it's pretty easy. So uh, Donors Choose is a collection of classroom projects that won't happen unless they're funded, right? Kickstarter is a collection of art projects, or whatever projects mm -hmm. that won't happen unless they're funded, right? It should be really easy for you to collect art projects that won't happen, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Like proposals. Yeah, lots of artists would submit. But then it's exactly like Couchsurfing, but specifically for art. Kickstarter. Yeah, so, Kickstarter well, so that part Kickstarter seems easy. So if I say that there's these two parts of designing this kind of system, and the one part is the um, collection of assets or whatever, Mm -hmm. And the, the other part is the um, decision-making process. Um, it seems like the collection of assets part for you is pretty easy. In fact, it's, it's easy to just collect all three different kinds of assets you can imagine. Potential projects, like proposals, wealthy people, and ordinary people support art, right? All those people will kind of like sign up for a thing. So that's easy. So the hard part entirely for you is this question of how how would a wealthy person or an ordinary person who supports art like browse proposals and discover that there's a proposal that they really want to support in some way, right? That seems actually really difficult, like as difficult as couchsurfing was, where you're browsing people and deciding that you want to stay with one, right? Uh, we had to experiment a lot with what kinds of information and text and mm -hmm. reviews and so on were necessary so that somebody would be like, oh, that one, I want to stay with that person, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess maybe there's a third part that's related to that part, which is like, how is that, what rewards do you get or whatever, right? We catch the thing, it's sort of connected, it's the reviews, the same reviews that hosts mm -hmm. get, visitors get. Mm -hmm. But it could be different for yours. Um, I think that's a really interesting question. It's a it's it's, it's a long research question, right? Yeah. It's like, wh why does someone like art, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's the question. Like, and what about this? this when it's, it's really so personal, strong, you know, there, there cannot be a recipe or an algorithm. But well, there's going to be a set of so capturing the mission. 
I don't know if you have used it much, but the top of the profile, it turned out the two most three most important pieces of information are their face. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, their in, their hobbies. No, 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 no. no? not important. Their mission in life, oh, like yeah, that was like that. It's like a tweet sized like yeah. sentence at the very top, and that turns out to like really make people feel connected, like really strongly connected, if they can relate to somebody's mission in life, and then number of positive reviews yeah. and the actual text of those reviews. So those three pieces of information are the things that turn a stranger into yeah. somebody that you're ready to host or stay with. Yeah. And so what are the pieces of information that turn an art project into something that you believe in passionately and want to see happen? I don't know. But also in Couchsurfing, you give uh, people um, a way to become protagonists, you know? They have a profile, they, they can upload pictures, they can write stuff about themselves. Mm-hmm. Whereas us, this will only happen for the artists, but not for everybody that supports the project. Well, you need a way for people to it was be incentivized fun. to participate. Yeah. And in couchsurfing, that, like, couchsurfing, one of the main ways that couchsurfing changes people's lives is by um, reframing for them what it is to be a successful person. As mm-hmm. someone who's like hospitable and kind and really listens, and like all of these virtues that are around yeah. being a good guest or being a good host. Yeah. Um, and Ketchum does that not just by actually having people stay together, but having them review each other. And there's a, like a message that gets sent before you stay for the first time where it's like, this is what it is to be a good guest. And when, when you get a review, your review is often in those kinds of terms. And so you start feeling like you're an amazing person, not because you're wealthy or because you're creative or whatever, but because you're kind and because you listen and whatever, right? And that's really good for people. Like, um, uh, yeah, it's it's a different uh, uh, valuing system. Yeah, and it's also people f- do feel successful, like even if they're not successful at first. Like, I think it's very healthy for people to be proud of their character, yeah, as yeah. opposed to say their accomplishments. Yeah. So that ends up being a reward, a very powerful reward. But it, it has this very personal element, you know. There is this space for people to have their personal profiles and get their personal reviews and so on. Well, what so I'm so saying on. is that what that is, is a reward. Yeah. Right? And so your system will need yeah, a, a reward. A reward. Yeah. It could be something like that. It could be something different. Yeah, that's very hard to... We also, I don't know... I, like what you said, like you, it depends what you want want to do. Also, I don't want to run a huge uh, Airbnb like platform. I'm not interested in making money at, at all from this. I'm interested in this experience. I'm interested in in feeling that I do something good. Mm. And how how can we? I mean, how can we we make this kind of this system? For me, it's always kind of turns back into politics. It always turns there is money. We don't need to give a euro for a poor artist. It seems to me like you, if you actually the two of you care about something different. Yeah. Um, and it true. seems to me like y- you should either go into politics or there is another <laughs> uh, there's another <laughs> approach that, that occurs to me, which would be cool, right? Like, so I actually think in Europe, actually maybe in, in Berlin right now, there's a lot there's a lot of room for political change and for political action, like um, the you know. EU is kind of like obviously in rough shape. Um, this Berlin is a wonderful like liberal kind of yeah. area. There's a lot of I don't know. So yeah, start a political party. That'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, we really have different motives. Whereas me, I'm more interested in um, in really making an experiment that could potentially grow and become kind of a, yeah. a, an organization. With people working for it, and, you know. which is cool, right? You can just take it over, and you can, go <laughs> I can speak. find another team. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can find another yeah team. it won't be hard, actually. I don't think. I think uh, you know uh, that's how I see it. That at the moment we have this platform, which is Transfidial, which is great because it has already a network of people uh, devoted to this, so we can have immediately a bigger sure, yeah. reach. So the, uh, the experiment one or two or ten, whatever we decide to go for, 
then um, then already have a, a public to start with. Yeah, yeah, that's great. But then if that goes well, and that's our experiment, then we should really build something out of that and really have this organization with, the, with board members and sure. you know. Yeah, you can. Like yeah, I think so too. I mean, I'm also not so much interested to only be doing that, but I don't think you're only doing couch surfing right, either. Right, right. You know, yeah, it's like many people. Yeah, I mean, usually somebody, not, some, several people have to devote their lives, but it doesn't have to be the same people that did the experiment. Although it helps if there's some, some continuity. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I do really like that, that, the, that the, the focus, it's, it's not a monetary system. It is not a... That you start no, but with it Airbnb should generate, or it should like generate some income. Otherwise, yeah, yeah. it doesn't if make sense. If you have, if you help free. a lot of people, it's not hard to have an income. Like honestly, if, if Couchsurfing somehow had not been able to collect donations, we still would have had millions of dollars a year because like individuals would just, would just have given us money. Like um, uh, as soon as you're helping hundreds of thousands or millions of people, which there are that many artists. Like, if you ever get into that situation, it's such a good situation to be in. Mm -hmm. Like, you're, you're just not going to have a problem. Mm -hmm. You're going to have people calling you constantly on the phone, asking you, like, telling you that it was the most amazing experience of their life, and how can they help? Mm -hmm. And you could be like, hey, do you know anybody wealthy? We're running out of money. <laughs> right? And after, you know, like, in, within a day, the wealthy people will be calling you or whatever, right? Like, it's going to be fine. Like, that's not the hard part. The hard part is helping a lot of people. I do want to say something about your idea about like you know, wealth distribution or something, which is I do think that um, there could be some kind of like social networky thing for rich people to help them do a much better job funding things and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and giving people things. And I, I well, that's think a different project. It's a different project, yeah. but I do think. It so, could be a possibility, actually, because there is a lot of wealthy people in the right. arts, you know, in, or in the That's city, right, in the yeah, arts. and they're doing shitty, they're making shitty decisions. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, they do want to help, but they just have no idea. And I'm sure that there are organizations, actually, that they go to, to... Uh, yeah, but they will could choose, turn like, an organization right. into a, an internet platform, an organization. And it seems like, actually, there's, there's not a lot of organizations doing a very good job connecting wealthy people and like super grassroots like artists the, uh, the artists that are actually broke yeah, yeah <laughs> right? exactly you know, like, choose the artists who are already doing very yeah, well yeah unfortunately so yeah. I, I think that could happen and I think it's mostly that other issue is it's, it's it's I actually don't think it's so much of a platform thing I, I think it's kind of an education thing yeah um like uh or making things more visible somehow. Yeah, so I'm thinking like there's a group in New York, I don't, I'm sure there's something similar here, or whatever. there's a group in New York of, of avant-garde theater producers called the New York Theater Workshop. And they meet once a week and they show little versions of what they're doing or whatever. And this is a really neat group because it's, um, it's uh, you don't apply to be a member, but it ends up being like, a, but people that are really serious about their craft and also are avant-garde are the people that are in it. Um, and so th this is like where you would expect if there's somebody who's like really awesome new theater person who does really trippy theater they're, and they're in New York they're going to be at this meeting right and they're probably not going to have any money <laughs> and then there's all these wealthy people in New York that are funding theater right and I think actually like the most straightforward thing to do in New York given the existence of those two groups is to have a meeting. To bring them in the same room, yeah, yeah. exactly. That's another, <laughs> that's another possibility we were uh, discussing, like how, you know, how does the physical um, exchange, you know, in physical and tangible space sure. t can yeah. take place uh, in this sort of system. So, for example, if we do the, system, the idea with the shares, so that people buy shares of an art, artwork, and then we all they all become, or also the artists themselves, co-owners together. Right. So they care equally, uh, or it depends how many shares you have. Right. Maybe you get more, or maybe you get a bit less. Yeah. But it, the idea is that you have a collective body of people caring about the future of this particular artwork, let's say. So you are, you're outsourcing your uh, per, just the personal investment of the artist to a group to a group of people, let's right. say, who are the caretakers. 
And then we could have, for example, uh, shareholders meetings right. that actually is the artwork itself, you know. So right. we have a discussion, a stage discussion of like this hundred people who are, and then what comes out of it, or it can happen even live, is like uh, this conversation, which is actually super important. I think, you know, because it's a, it's really could have the potential to change how people think about ownership about um, sure. what is art and what not, you know, what, where to place, what what they are doing at that moment. It seems to me likely that if you thought for a long time about these two, like about the rewards and about the sort of process of deciding what art you'd want to be a shareholder in or whatever, exactly these two things, you'd, you'd end up with something different than what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Like... Um, uh, the reward of being a shareholder in a company is money, <laughs> right? Yes. Um, the reward of being a shareholder in an art is like kind of like undefined in your description, but you're sort of you're near some things that could be a reward. Like if you like, so um, you guys you might must know um, a friend of mine, Steve Lambert. Um, he has this sign that says "Capitalism works for me, yes or no," that he's touring the world with right now. Um, ah, yeah, he, he's an artist, right? Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, he's, he's wonderful. Um, uh, we, yeah, we used to hang out together in San Francisco. Um, he, he did his sign as a Kickstarter, I think, and one of the main rewards for donating a lot of money to the sign was that you, I think you had to donate something like $20,000 if you, if you wanted this reward, was that you could decide a, a city or a location. Well, so the sign is a, it's a sign, it's a neon sign, but you can vote for whether capitalism works for you. So if you say yes, then a, like a number goes up. If you say no, a number goes up, right? Uh, right, right, right. Yeah, okay. um, yeah. So if you donate like $20,000, he would actually like bring the sign to your city mm -hmm. um, and uh, display it there and let the people of your city vote, right? Mm -hmm. And that created... I mean, that, that was like a really strong incentive for people to donate really big money because they're, yeah, it's very different than just like some abstract share ownership, right? Like, like you're actually stewarding and deciding on the future of, you know, this, this, this artwork, right, where it travels. And he did a bunch of other smart ones, too. He, Exactly. That's something I was thinking. Like, if if you have this collective body of uh, of investors or of right. owners, then they can decide to what kind of exhibitions this work is being di displayed, or you know, things like that. Yeah. No, I think that's we're starting to get a little bit closer to like a clearer idea of reward. Um, yeah, it seems like there's a, you could go a long way in that direction. Like. You have to think. I think in terms of individual artworks. I mean, that's how I would start. I would, mm -hmm. I would, I'd be like, okay, for this. Take an example. Yeah. yeah like what would really motivate studies. people? And then you could make that one of your cross ten mm -hmm. kinds of things. Because that's a really easy thing to test, right? Like, hey, would you, would you donate fifty bucks to be able to decide, like, and attend an exhibition meeting or something? So with Couch Ribbing, it's two things together. The way that you decide who to stay with is an algorithm and the profiles, right? Those two things together. So you have some similar thing to experiment with, which is like um, about how people decide, and how people come to encounter the artwork that they are, you know, most enthused about. It's algorithm and... Uh... Well, pro it was profiles for catch surfing, but I, I, it's a process, really, is what it is, right? Yeah. It's just like you have a person, and how do they become convinced that they should do this transaction, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, if you imagine you already have users, and you already have um, proposals or something, mm -hmm. how do they come together, right? And then the third thing to experiment with is um, re reward. What will be most rewarding? In this, mm -hmm. right? So, if, if you're going to make a platform, then you're going to spend maybe the next year experimenting with these different, these two different things. Yeah. I started this thing for entrepreneurs called Dow Club. Um, it's like a almost alcoholics anonymous, like kind of like secret meeting of entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. where they talk about their doubts and fears. <laughs> um, I've heard about these things somewhere. 
maybe, probably for me, but there are a few other people that know about it. Um, yeah, anyway, <laughs> I really believe that it's necessary for people to go into these kind of scary moments, yeah. especially with, like, ethical things, but this is kind of an ethical thing, right? Like It is. I mean, yeah. when it's about money, it's always about yeah. ethics. Yeah, well. so then it seems super important to be willing to take on you know, doubts and scary questions and things like that, and mm-hmm. not just kind of push a solution in, right? Yeah, definitely. So I think there's a kind of a balance that unfortunately is not part of business at all right now, but ideally people would almost spend like a week doing business as usual and a week questioning everything. And then mm-hmm. do, you know, no. <laughs> so when does the next meeting happen if perhaps we should come? <laughs> <laughs> there isn't a doubt club Berlin yet. It's all in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. It's it started true. here. I haven't met all the <laughs> Yeah, I haven't met any entrepreneurs that are actually, like the reason I started in San Francisco is because there's so many people that have so much impact that have very little time in which they're doing this kind of doubt, you know, fear thing, or none at all. I'm friends with the guys who started Instagram, mm-hmm. and. Um, both of them are privately super concerned about selfies and like women and how young women, like twelve year olds and thirteen year old girls, like think of themselves as hot and what like that's doing or whatever. But they don't really have anybody they can talk to about their concerns because they're it's just a depressing thing for all the people that work at Instagram. Like they don't want to think about it. Like it would just be bad for their employees and it's bad for press to talk about it. It's like you know what I mean? So that they feel super guilty, yeah. but they don't have anybody to, 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 yeah. to think with or to talk with yeah. about it or whatever. So, And once I noticed that, I noticed there were a lot of people that were in that kind of situation. Google is actually kind of in that situation. Uh, what do you mean? <laughs> Does Google feel guilty? <laughs> well, so there's this one particular thing. So often, like, Europe is upset about Google for, like, privacy and all these kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but the founders of Google are worried about a different thing, which is that um, all of their money, 98% of their income comes from Google Ads. And Google Ads, if you look at the content and the people that click them over time, are converging onto spam and really stupid people. Like, yeah. It's all about like selling Viagra yeah. to people that are really dumb. No. <laughs> right. Ooh. So they they produce stupid uh, data. Yeah. yeah. And so that's so money. Money comes from stupidity. <laughs> yeah, it's really embarrassing for the people that started Google. It's also not what they wanted. Like, right? Like it's the opposite of this sort of story. Like Google is supposed to be this kind of like high tech thing that's advancing humanity and like. Helping people connect with knowledge or whatever. Mm-hmm. So like, but they also sell uh, information to NSA. I'm sure they generate lots of income from that. No, not, I mean, not, not anything compared to how much they sell Viagra <laughs> and like l- lawyers that will like sue your former employer and like um, weight loss pills that don't work. And so all the things that are wrong with our society somehow. Yeah, like that's how Google makes actually makes all their money. So it's funny, like because you're and you think that's even more scary than, than uh, the, the discourse about NSA and data. I do actually. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not actually very concerned with um, privacy. I am concerned with politics, um, and there's a way in which these things are kind of connected. Um, I think that all of Europe and certainly all of Germany is focused on the wrong dystopia. Um, uh, 1984 uh, by George Orwell. Right, you know what I'm talking about. No. Oh, there's this book. Yeah, yeah, no, I know book. the book. Yeah. Oh, you, you yeah. Sure? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't know the basics. <laughs> <laughs> it's a book about this dystopian surveillance state where even your thoughts are visible to the state. It's very scary and bad. But around the same time, actually, like, I think ten years earlier, another dystopian book was written, Brave New World. Have you heard of it? Yeah. I haven't read that. But. Yeah, so Brave New World has a very different idea of what could go wrong in society. Brave New World is a situation where it's not that there's censorship and no one can read the news or that there's surveillance everywhere, yeah. but the people are entertained by trivialities. And Which is what is actually happening. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and every nobody really like everybody's lives are so kind of like comfortable and efficient and busy that there's no time to really actually connect with other people. Um, but that's that's exactly the discourse here. You know, all this critique that that I, I hear here sure. is a lot about that. Yeah, yeah. I well, uh, I mean. If you look at volume of news articles, no, there's much more about privacy and surveillance and the NSA and so on and so forth. But if you if you're just saying it does exist, I think it's a mix. I think it's it's both. Like if like a Trasmediano, actually right. we're the office of Trasmediano here. Um, we saw this lecture last year from uh, the uh, the Korean professor Pyeonjul Han, who was actually saying that. The, We've reached this scary moment where we live in a great panopticon where we actually voluntarily display ourselves all the time, you know, sure. and we are even think that we're, we're having fun by doing that. And that's the scariest way to control society by like outsourcing this, the job, first of all, outsourcing the job to ourselves, and secondly, under this disguise of being, of being something, being something entertaining. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So it's really how how to, how to put up with that, you know, how to to fight that, and uh, it's really difficult. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's 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 the main reason that I'm working on this new economy stuff is because I think that um, I don't know. Have you have you read Society of the Spectacle? Mm-hmm. I I think Tabor is pretty much entirely right. Like, and it's in the nature of capitalism to eventually turn into this kind of, um, yeah. like, to replace all authentic experience with images. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, that's what's happening. And it's driven not by technology, but by money. Yeah. Um, mostly just because it's always cheaper to sell a fake thing than a real thing. It's cheaper to sell an exercise bike than to figure out how to actually make someone, help someone get fit. It's possible to do both, right? Like, there are personal trainers. Mm-hmm. They be, so ideally, in some cases, they become responsible for you getting fit, right? But they're more expensive than an exercise bike. Exactly, like the, <laughs> the personal trainers is the new commodity instead of the of the product, which is the bike. Right. right? You know, but yeah, it's interesting. And what you really want for the commodity, like for the market to provide, is is a way for someone to get fit. But systematically, even if Let's say originally, let's say 10 years ago, personal trainers were about getting fit, right? But then some new personal trainers came along that were just about, about making the person feel like they were going to get fit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? just, about, just about making money, not really about what That's right. yeah. you want to do. So I see that as like the fundamental problem. I think it's driving us not towards surveillance states. I don't think that actually... As far as I can tell, I have friends that are at the highest levels in Facebook and Google and so on and so forth. Europe's got it wrong. Those people feel like uh, the spy agencies are a terrible nuisance. Like, like they're not making money from it. They're, um, uh, you know, pu- putting up with, with it. But those companies are, whenever they make choices about what will make money, they're in the same matrix and they're going to tend to replace things that actually help with things that seem to help, yeah. right? Yeah. And um, yeah, so I, I see that as the big problem with surveillance, it's not a problem. And I don't see a way to stop it without changing capitalism. Yeah, I think I think capitalism was a good idea for a while and not maybe for the last... 70 years, 100 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it, it worked for a long... There's actually a moment. I don't know. Have you ever seen... There's a BBC documentary, Century of the Self. Mm-hmm. Ah, uh, yeah. Have you seen it? We started seeing it. It's like four parts, right? We've seen yeah. it the first one. It might be the first part. There's a, yeah, there's, I would love Adam Curtis. Yeah. He's great. Smart guy. Yeah. Um, there's a moment... I think it might actually be in the first part. Happiness of the Mocinos. Um, I, don't, I don't remember. She is a heaven. Um, uh, there's a moment where the I think it was it's one of the directors of a major American multinational like um, Sears or, or GE or something um, and they're making appliances they're selling uh, washing machines or something and uh, they reach this point where everyone has bought a washing machine and they there's this memo 
where they wrote to their marketer or person or something, and they're like, it seems like people have, have what they need, so we're going to need to invent... Something else. Yeah, new needs. <laughs> or a way to get them to buy things that they don't really need. <laughs> and that's it. Like, that's the moment that this, this ship that we're all on... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it's true. It's true. <laughs> and then you have all the CO two pollution. So. Yeah. There's also this new book of David Graeber out. I haven't read it yet. Yeah, I haven't read it either. The, but it sounds this I don't know the Utopia of Roots or something like yeah. that. Yeah. And it sounds it is but it is a little bit about something similar about the reproduction of stupid. Um, yeah professions and jobs, you know, like so many people not not being happy with what you're, they're doing, not even maybe understanding what they're doing and thinking that what they're doing is completely useless, you know, like... Sure. So, and uh, since people keep being fine with that because it offers them this comfort zone of having money and having, you know, the, the easy way of life, of living, they will still keep doing that. And yeah. Yeah, it's super interesting to me. Um, uh, in San Francisco, I was just visiting a friend who works at Google, um, and Google has San Francisco has a super vibrant economy, right? So if you want to leave your job at a big company and work for a small company, you can. Um, there's a certain there's a few corners at Google that are very exciting to work at, like if you work on self driving cars or something and, and you're clearly doing like that you're the best place in the world to do what you want but mostly Google is an advertising company or kind of a you know a software company maintaining a lot of stuff it's not a super exciting place to work which means that the people that are, most of the people are still working at Google are the people that were sort of too scared to leave even though it's very easy to leave yeah. um, and so it's interesting to look around at these people who were most excited about lunch <laughs> like, yeah, know? I mean, that's so sad. Come yeah. On. <laughs> Lance is your most, ex most exciting moment of your day. I think 90% of the working people is like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's it's really sad. Yeah. I believe that we can have operating systems and social networks that are all about sharing wisdom and reflecting. Rather than about but I mean, if somebody profits from, from their work somehow, yeah, yeah, you yeah. profit from it in a, in also also in a monetary terms, no? I, yeah, I, I, also, I don't think. Well, no. I mean, so I'm not. Uh, it's not what you don't. Know. I, I think this is one of the ways where Marxism is just like not helpful at all. Like, this whole digital label labor bullshit is bullshit. Like, like. The thing that's wrong about selfies has nothing to do with Facebook making money, <laughs> right? And everything okay, to do with, like... we talked about this, I understand, but... If, yeah. Yeah, but... Like, if you can make money by doing something that people really, like... Like, I also run uh, events, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I run game events, where people get together and they play street games and things like that. Yeah. That's when people start to come out and play. Yeah, yeah. The people that participate in come out and play do not make any money off come out and play. But the people that run come out and play have all these career advantages. Of course. Right? Yeah. Do I feel bad that I'm like extracting the labor of the people playing my games? No. I'm giving them the fucking <laughs> best day they've had in months. Right? <laughs> it's like a real benefit. That's like the deal. Like I'm doing something wonderful for them. They just show up and they have all these games they can play. Right? Okay. If you're providing something that's really of value, it has nothing to do with who makes money or who benefits or something, everything to do with whether it's real value or fake value. Mm -hmm. that's okay. what I so that's how you judge, that's where your your ethical limit is. That you wouldn't do the same things you do if you would believe that your games are shit and it's, you know, it's a great way for you to make money, but... Yeah, I think we need to know what people really want with what people want in life. Mm -hmm. And what they feel lastingly good about, and and we're responsible for moving towards that rather than away from it. Yeah. Right? So if people really want to know their neighbors, and you help them know their neighbors, that's great. You know, mm -hmm. people really want to know their people.
people who really want to find love, and you help them find love, that's great. If people really want to find love, and you um, get them to pay a subscription fee, and you keep showing them profiles of people, but you may never find love, then you're a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.